the main task of the European and American jurisdiction today is how to confiscate Russian assets, but in such a way as not to harm the security of the jurisdiction. It is important to confiscate not only sovereign assets, but also the assets of residents who are on the sanction lists. Hello and welcome to Ukraine in Flames, a special project by Ukraine Media Center and NGO Euro-Atlantic Force. And I'm your host, Maroslava Yeremkiv. Shortly after the second anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, it also marked two years since the introduction of an unprecedented package of sanctions against the Russian Federation by Western countries. The boldest measure in this initiative was the immobilization of the reserves that the Russian Central Bank kept in the West, designed to create such shock in the Russian financial system that it would prompt the Kremlin to reconsider its aggression. This the policy really forced Moscow to introduce controls on the movement of capital, which it had long tried to avoid. But it also served Moscow's short-term purpose and helped the country withstand the initial shock of the sanctions and continue to finance its illegal war. In today's episode, we'll discuss why the foreign assets of the Russian Federation haven't been transferred to Ukraine yet, and how this could legally occur in the near future. If you want to learn more about the subject, please continue watching this video and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss our videos in the future. EU and G7 countries have jointly frozen more than 300 billion euros of Russian assets. These are mostly funds of the Central Bank of the Russian Federation. In total, Russia's state reserves amount to nearly 550 billion euros, so about half of them are currently blocked. The lion's share of these funds, more than 200 billion euros, are kept in the security depositories of Euroclear in Belgium and Clearstream in Luxembourg. Now the money just sits on their accounts. They're not confiscated, but only blocked. For two years now, EU countries have been wondering what to do with these assets and how can they use them in a way that would benefit Ukraine. At the same time, Ukraine could have used this money to repair transport infrastructure, restore destroyed educational institutions, build new hydroelectric power plants and cover a large part of defense expenditures. More on that, please welcome Executive Director of the NGO Euro-Atlantic Course, Igor Selecki. The issue of confiscation of Russian assets for the benefit of Ukraine is not a question of whether it should be done or not. I don't remember who said, justice is above the law. No European or Belgian law could predict that at the beginning of the 21st century a nuclear country would start a war with another country over its territory. The law simply could not foresee this. Accordingly, this country must pay for this. It must pay the victim country. And actually, this is an ideal situation when the aggressor country pays the victim country with its assets for the fact that the victim country simply opposes the aggressor country. The main issue now is how to maintain the security of the jurisdiction. Not because in reality jurisdictions are competing with each other for the safety of the assets they hold. The American jurisdiction competes with the European one, the European jurisdiction with the American one, and now they all compete with Arab jurisdiction, with Saudi Arabia and the Arab Emirates, for the simple reason that Russian assets began to hide there. That is the main task of the European and American jurisdiction today, is uh, how to confiscate Russian assets but in such a way as not to harm the security of the jurisdiction. I think that this is a fundamentally wrong position. That is why we do not confiscate all assets, but only dividends from assets 
such concepts. It seems to me that this is fundamentally not even a wrong position, but a value-based wrong position because there is an attempt to reconcile the liberal value of the rule of law what we have cannot be confiscated just like that there must be a reason and it is better if that reason is a court uh, decision with the value-based position that you do not confiscate the assets of the state uh, who said i'm not interested in your international law, I'm not interested in your rule of law, I have decided that I have to uh, have the right to start a war against another country because I have decided so. And this attempt to combine the liberal value of the rule of law with the value of the democratic world has a priori a great conflict that cannot be resolved in favor of jurisdictional security for one simple reason if it is important to you to confiscate the assets of a terrorist state in such a, a way as not to damage your jurisdictions that means you simply need the assets of other terrorist states in your jurisdiction iran russia it doesn't matter who will be next there that is, you seem to be telling the world, I do not want to confiscate them, which means that I am waiting for the assets of other terrorist states. Therefore, in principle, there is no room for discourse here for me. The assets of the Russian Federation must be confiscated in full and not just dividends and given to Ukraine, which must defend itself and restore itself at the expense of these assets. And this is critical. This if we say that the West has values. The US House of Representatives has approved a draft law that provides the possibility of confiscation of sovereign assets of the Russian Federation in favor of Ukraine and the expansion of anti-Russian sanctions. In particular, the U.S. president is empowered to apply the procedure of confiscation of sovereign assets with subsequent transfer of the relevant assets to special funds, compensation fund or Ukraine support fund. At the same time, the president can agree on the algorithm for the transfer of confiscated Russian assets to Ukraine with the countries of the G7, the EU, Australia and other U.S. partners. Yaroslav Sidorovich from the European Cooperation Agency will discuss this law and its implementation procedure for the benefit of Ukraine. The important tumultuous events that took place on Capitol Hill in April gave hope that the war in Ukraine could be ended. And not only by armed resistance to Russian aggression, but also by certain ways of financially depriving the Russian Federation of its resources. The law that was passed has a telling name. The 21st Century Peace Through Strength Act. The House of Representatives considered and passed the bills on April 20 and the Senate combined these separate bills into one law and passed it. President Biden signed it on April 24th. This large, quite important law provides aid to Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, totaling $95 billion. I'd like to dwell on an important part of this law, called the REPO for Ukrainians Act. This is a law that allows the President of the United States, he is given great rights to apply to Russia. In this law, Russia is called the Russian aggressor state, 
not only Russia, but also Belarus, if the President of the United States admits that Belarus is committing aggression against Ukraine. Uh, that is, there is a special definition of the aggressor state of Russia. It gives the right to the president to repurpose assets that are sovereign assets protected by immunity, international law, that is, to take Russian ownership and direct it to other purposes. The law actually says a support fund for Ukraine, which will be created in the United States of America and also be sent to an international compensation fund for Ukraine. This fund will be established in The Hague. If we talk about Russian officials' reaction to the adoption of the law, by the United States, it is extremely sharp, it is hysterical. We have heard the reactions of many officials, in particular the chairman of the State Duma, Volodin, said that now we have the right to confiscate Western assets on the territory of Russia. In fact, Russia has been doing this for a long time. When Crimea was seized, Putin issued a decree in 2020 that those without Russian citizenship cannot own land. Thus, he deprived individuals and legal entities of ownership of land with the stroke of his pen. And during the full-scale invasion, we see the Russian president's decrees on the deprivation of property. There are many such decrees on the deprivation of property of Western companies. The decree stipulates to transfer to management, that is, the property of subsidiaries of Western companies, such as Swedish, Austrian, German, it is transferred to the management of some structure subordinate to the government, but not necessarily to the government. It can be billionaires close to Putin. And by the way, according to the Forbes list, there are now 124 of them. There were 110 billionaires in 2022, whereas now their number increases. They got rich and continue to get richer in this war. And therefore, it is important to confiscate not only sovereign assets, but also the assets of residents who are on the sanction lists. You've been watching a special project by Ukraine Media Center and Euro-Atlantic course dedicated to the Russian-Ukrainian war, Ukraine in Flames. In the description under this video, you can find information on how you can help Ukraine fight Russian aggression. If you find our work useful, please like and share this video. Slava Ukraini!